Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get this session started. Um, the title of this afternoon's session is kind of a long one, so I'm going to say the second part of it. Uh, it's OMI, Deciphering the Alphabet Soup of Nuclease-Based genome, genome Editing and Its Clinical Applications. We have three outstanding speakers, um, Dr. Weiss from St. Jude's, Dr. Orkin from uh, Boston Children's Hospital, and Dr. Scott from Baylor at Texas. And um, rather than go into an introduction about the importance of this, we're going to just invite Dr. Weiss up first to give you a primer on uh, these, these nuclease-based uh, technologies and the basic principles of genome editing. Hi. Um, thank you, Dan and Val, for inviting me. Um, my job is to uh, give you, um, is to introduce geno genome editing um, by reviewing the basic principles for you. So I'll get started with that. So this is my definition. Um, geno genome editing is a tool to alter um, genomic DNA accurately and specifically. And, and we're using this in the laboratory now for a number of things, including creating disease models, and, um, and you can use it to correct deleterious mutations in patients. And um, I would say in the last five to ten years, probably closer to five, this technology has transformed basic research. Um, and, and I think part of the reason that we're here is because we all know that this can also tr uh, transform clinical medicine, and it's poised to do that. So the cornerstone, the key technology to genome editing is based, is based on a set of pro uh, proteins called programmed engineered nucleases, or molecular scissors. And these are proteins that can be programmed to create site-specific double-stranded breaks um, wherever you want in the genome according to the sequence specificity. So here are the basic principles that I'm going to review with you in the next 20 minutes. I'm going to tell you about the programmable nucleases, or the so-called molecular scissors, that create the double-stranded breaks. And we'll talk about what happens after a double-stranded break occurs. Um, we'll talk about delivery methods, how you get these programmable nucleases into cells, and off-target effects or undesired side effects of, of the nucleases. And uh, we'll talk about um, uh, how to reduce off-target effects by, by increasing the specificity. So these are, the, these are the four basic types of proteins that, that can create sequence-specific double-stranded breaks in DNA, and most of you have probably heard of most of these. Zinc finger nucleases, or ZFNs, tail nucleases, talons, meganucleases, and, and CRISPR-Cas nucleases. And what, what, one point that, that I think it is important to make is that all, all of these editing nucleases were discovered through basic science by by scientists who, um, who, who were not intending to um, do something that had big therapeutic or, or commercial options, which is always a good argument to let a good basic scientist alone in the lab, and if they're doing good work, to, to uh, let them continue, because you never know what you're going to find that's going to be useful, and because, of course, knowledge itself is, is, is valuable. So, um, one thing I would like to point out is how these uh, programmable nucleases recognize specific sequences in DNA, and they do the, this in a modular way. So, for example, talons, zinc, the zinc finger nucleases, and the meganucleases recognize DNA through protein interfaces. So, what you have to do to design these is engineer the protein portion of these, uh, of these nucleases to recognize specific nucleotide sequences, and that can be pretty complicated. Um, on the other hand, CRIS the CRISPR system, or CRISPR-Cas9, um, recognizes DNA through RNA called a guide RNA. So for this, all you have to do is synthesize an RNA that's complementary to your DNA sequence that you want to alter, and um, you are uh, ready to go. And so this is, a, um, this is a bigger picture of the Cas9 with the guide RNA, and you can see that, that um, what happens is the protein um, um, opens up the DNA, it has unwinding activity, and this, this portion of the guide RNA is complementary to the region that you want to um, 
modify, and then there's an endogenous nuclease activity in the Cas9 that will create the double-stranded break. So this is tremendously easy, um, whereas um, programming by proteins, as I mentioned, is complicated. And the fact that this is so easy has really revolutionized work in the lab. I mean, I remember I, uh, my, my postdocs in my lab just started doing it and presenting these experiments to me. And you can learn it very quickly, and almost anybody can do it. And now if you're interested in a gene or a region of DNA, you just disrupt it or change it, and you can study the effects on cells and in mice. So this has made a huge difference um, in, in the lab. And of course, the clinical applications are also now very exciting. Um, and it has led to this um, CRISPR craze, as, as referred to by Science Magazine. And these are some of the, the, the major people who have contributed to the, to the development of these nucleases. And I guess they're battling it out now for um, Nobel Prizes and lots of patent money and stuff like that. Um, but they really have changed the way we work. So the next thing I would like to discuss is what happens after a double-stranded DNA break. So, um, so up here is a piece of DNA, and this is the this is the uh, 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 break shown here by a by a, a programmable nuclease. And there are two main outcomes to a double-stranded DNA break. The first outcome is called non-homologous end joining, or NHEJ. And what happens is the cell does not like to have a double-stranded DNA break because when it starts to divide, it won't know what to do with the chromosomes, and so there's. A, a lot of defense systems in place, and uh, it, it will try very hard to repair this as quickly as possible. And so it will put pieces together um, without much specificity. And, and, and so what, what will happen is the break can get sealed, but there can be variable mutations um, within the two ends, uh, either deletions where, where different numbers of nucleotides are removed or insertions where nucleotides are added. And so in, in, in this way, the, um, this process is impre imprecise. And if it occurs within a protein coding region, it can be obviously damaging. Or if it occurs within a DNA regulatory region, as you'll hear in my talk and in Stu's talk next. Um, on the other hand, there's another process called homology-directed repair, or HDR. And this can occur when you supply a donor template. So this template is, is homologous. These, these, these um, matching parts here, these overhangs, are the same as, as the genomic DNA. And, and in, in here, you might put what you want to change. And so what happens is that a different set of cellular enzymes can repair this by integrating the template into the site of the break. This is called homolog homologous recombination or, or homology-directed repair. And through this, you can create a precise insertion or modification so that you can have a very pinpointed change. And so this process is precise, and it can be used to correct or create specific mutations. So this is probably the key to understanding these processes, is to know, understand the difference between NHEJ and HDR. Um, now, one problem in the field is that NHJ, NHEJ is favored over HDR in most tissues, especially in tissues that are not dividing, like stem cells, because stem, because it, um, it's, it's thought that, that homology-directed repair require, requires cell division, so you don't get it, or you don't get it as much when a cell's not dividing, and this would be most stem cells, including hematopoietic stem cells. So in most of the literature on, on on gene editing and hematopoietic stem cells, you can get approximately 20 to 50 percent NHEJ in a hematopoietic stem cell, for example. But with HDR, the reported rates are, are 5 percent or less, so almost an order of magnitude difference. So it's easier to destroy something um, with, by NHEJ than it is to repair a, a precise mutation. Now, I, I'm going to talk about this a little bit in the context of sickle cell disease because it's a, it's a, it's a research interest of mine. And at St. Jude, um, we have lots of sickle cell patients, about 900. And this, this is Win Wong, who's, who won the ASFO Distinguished Career Award a few years ago and has taught me a lot about, uh, about taking care of sickle cell patients. And um, I think every, every pediatrician in this room who has taken care of a sickle cell patient 
our fantasy is to cure them before we send them out to adult care because we know what happens when they leave. Um, and, um, and so uh, um, when I moved to St. Jude three years ago, I, um, I started thinking about this problem in the lab. Um, so so I, want you, um, I want to get back to the, the point of the differences between homology-directed repair and non-homologous end joining using sickle cell as an example. And I think Stu will have more to say about this in the next talk and go into it in more um, comprehensively. Um, so you have sickle cell disease and it's a point mutation and um, it would be great to fix that point mutation by homology directed repair by providing this template and swapping in this T for an A that is supposed to be there. And this, this, this is what you want. Um, however, there's a competition between homology directed repair and non homologous end joining. And with non homologous end joining, you have these variable uh, nucleotides introduced after your, the site of your break. And Usually, it, it, two, two out of three times, it's going to disrupt the reading frame of the protein. You're going to end up with a beta naught or a thalassemic allele. So, so you can get this, but you usually get more of this. And, and the question that we don't know the answer to is what, how much of this can be tolerated uh, uh, for getting this? And this is going to have to be figured out. And I think it will be. Um, now, I, I want to talk to you about editing the gene in hematopoietic stem cells. So the first experiment you can do is you can take CD34 cells, a stem cell enriched population, and you can edit them and you can measure the editing at your target. But we all know that CD34 cells are mostly not stem cells, maybe 1% HSCs in there, 5% at the most. And so what you measure in the bulk population doesn't tell you about editing stem cells. And, um, and um, um, and so the, the way, the, way to, the, the on, only good assay that we have to measure editing in stem cells is in xenotransplantation experiments in, in mice. And so that experiment is shown here. One would um, edit the CD34 cells, transplant them into immunodeficient mice and wait at least 16 or 18 weeks. And the cells that are left around after that amount of time are thought to approximate the human hematopoietic stem cell. And then you can measure the editing here. And, and, and I'll just give you an example of that. This is, um, this is a study from Jacob Korn's lab where he measured editing in, um, in, in human HSCs in, in, in this kind of way at the beta globin locus, trying to look at the ratio between HDR and NHEJ. And what you can see here, this is the marrow at 16 weeks. The HDR is 2.5 percent. The NHEJ is 45 percent. So that's an experimental demonstration of, of, of what I told you. So uh, conclusions up to now, NHEJ is much greater than HDR and HSCs. And in most tissues, for that, for that matter, how can we favor NHEJ? This is a hot topic of research now. Is there anything that we can do in the editing process to make H and homology directed repair occur at higher frequency? Um, the other conclusion is because you can get NHEJ um, uh, more easily, this approach may be more tractable for sickle cell disease. And, and other hematopoietic stem cell or other stem cell based therapies. And I say currently because I th there's a lot of good labs working on HDR for hematopoietic stem cells, and there, this, this I believe will work someday. But I think that this is th this is more approachable now, is is my opinion. Um, so I'm going to give you an example of some work in my laboratory. Um, this we started this about uh, two and a half years ago, and this is work by Liz Traxler and Yu Yao. And, 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 and this is work um, to try to raise fetal hemoglobin by NHEJ. So this is the beta globin locus, and of course the HBB is where you have the sickle cell mutation. And we, know, we all in here know that high fetal hemoglobin will, is protective against sickle cell disease. And um, we also all know here that there's a disorder called hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin, or HPFH, where adults um, are walking around with high fetal hemoglobin levels. And this, is an, this, um, this box represents a 13 nucleotide deleted region in one form of HPFH. And, and this is thought to, to remove a region in the, in the gamma globin 1 or HPG1 promoter that binds repressor proteins. So when you take it away, gamma globin is derepressed. And Liz asks what happens if you, 
if you create a double-stranded break there um, using uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 with no guide strands, so no homology-directed repair. So she did this editing on CD34 cells and differentiated them into, into red cells in vitro and measured the fetal hemoglobin. And here's what she found. Um, if you look in the bulk population, the, with, with our best guide, um, the percent fetal hemoglobin goes from about 4% to about uh, just under 20%. And if you look at F cells, that is immunostaining for fetal hemoglobin producing cells, you start at about 18 with the controls and you can go up to about, here's this, this guide is 54 and this guide is, um, is 38. And if we do the same thing with sickle cell CD34 cells and differentiate them into, into reticulocytes, um, w uh, um, what you see here is what happens to these cells when we expose them to low oxygen tension. And this is kind of a surrogate assay for sickling, I think. You can see these little strands coming off of some of these, um, some of these cells. And, um, and uh, what we did was uh, we, we measured these and, and, and counted them blindly and, and manually, and we compared the, this, this in vitro sickling with and without editing. And what you can see here is that um, after editing, there's a substantial decrease in the percentage of sickled cells compared to the controls. So at least in vitro, we can treat sickle cell disease. Um, the, the next question in this project is, I, I, I told you that you can't tell anything about editing hematopoietic stem cells by looking at the editing of a CD34 positive bulk population. So we did the mouse experiment, and this is work by John Eves Matei, and um, he edited the cells, as I showed you in the last slide, put them into immunodeficient mice, and analyzed the human cells uh, between 16 and 18 weeks later. And, and, and these bars show the percent editing, and there's a couple of take-home points here. Um, the, 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 black, the black portion of these bars shows the 13 nucleotide deletion that, that the patients have, and, and, and the white part shows other deletions. And we think that most of those other deletions are going to raise F because they're in that region of repressor binding. But there's a couple of points I'd like to make. The first one is that you can see that the, the, the percent editing goes down over time. And um, uh, 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 th this is more dramatic than I've seen from some other groups, but in most of the data that's published, this happens. The editing of the bulk population is usually greater than the editing uh, in stem cells. And I think, it, I think we have to figure this out, but I think that the cells, stem cells do not like having double-stranded DNA breaks, and my guess is that you're, you're activating death pathways um, it, 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 that, that are preferentially um, uh, um, prominent in, in HSCs. The other point is that his, um, his, his percent indels are, are, are fairly low in the HSCs, 20%. And most papers, I think, reporting, and we're just getting started with these experiments, mo most papers um, report somewhere around 40% of the NHEJ in the, in, the, in the hematopoietic stem cells. And actually, as I was preparing this, this talk, I, last night I sent JY an email and I said, these don't compare. You know, what, what do you think the problem is? Yours are, yours are a bit low. And, and he sent me this slide, and, um, and w w what this slide said, basically what the slide says is how you measure the, 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 um, the gene editing affects the results. So he was measuring using a method called TIDE, which is a computational based method based on Sanger sequencing. Um, but when he went and measured the, um, the, um, the editing, the same type of editing using next generation sequencing, you get about a a 30 percent, 20 to 30 percent increase in the in the percentage of edited cells, and I think what what, what we've learned from this is how you look at things uh, uh, um, can determine what you see. And I, I guess the other thing I looked at is that I learned is I should be talking to my postdocs more often because um, I think this is a few weeks old. Um, okay, next I want to talk about delivery. Um, how much time do I have? 17. Okay. So how do we get these things into cells? I told you about NHEJ and I told you about homology-directed repair. So if you're going to use zinc fingers, you need two zinc fingers, two, two proteins go into a cell. Same for talons. For Cas9, you also need a guide RNA, which presents different problems. And if you want to 
do homology directed repair, you also need to get template into the cells. So now you, with, with CRISPR Cas9, you gotta get three things into the cells. And each component adds complexity because RNA is different than proteins. You can't usually add things as DNA, that's usually toxic to cells. Um, and, um, and for HDR, you need this, this template. So the more you wanna do, the more complicated it gets. Um, at least in a, in a, therapeutically. All of these are pretty simple to do in the lab if you don't have to have a high frequency. Okay, so, so, how, so, so, so what about delivery? There, there, there's, there's, you can divide this into really two different approaches. One approach is in vivo delivery. That is, you, you somehow, through an intravenous or an intratissue injection, introduce the, the editing tools into the patient directly. The other way, which I think is, well, maybe, maybe a bit more common, is to take some cells out of the patient. Um, in our world, it's usually hematopoietic stem cells. Edit them and reintroduce them into the patient. Okay, and um, so for in vivo, um, y y you would like to have some specificity. You don't want to edit every tissue. And, and, and this is achieved in two different ways. And, and I think the, the field now is to do what's doable. And so, um, for example, there's therapy being explored in, um, uh, to, to, um, to, to cure eye diseases um, by gene editing because the eye is a privileged site and you can inject these tools into the eye and it's not going to get out of the eye into the body and it can be concentrated there. The other approach is to use vec viral vectors with tissue-specific um, selectivity or specificity. And an example of this is using the, the adeno-associated virus to deliver gene editing tools to the, to the liver to treat hemophilia. Um, ex vivo pr um, uh, um, provides a different set of problems. So, th so the requirements that you're looking at to have good ex vivo editing is you want it to be transient. You don't want those editing tools to stick around in your cells forever. You want it to be non-toxic and, um, and also you want to get the highest efficiency that you can in the cell that you're trying to modify. Um, so ways to approach that, th these are the methods that are currently being used now. Pro electroporation for Cas9 is probably the most common method. So you take the Cas9 and you complex it with your guide RNA and that will stabilize the RNA and you put it, you put it into cells by mixing it with the cells and giving them a jolt of electricity, which I can't believe is that great for cells. And I'm sure that there are going to be better ways to do this. Um, uh, uh, other people are using viral vectors, which is a common way to deliver the guide RNA if you're trying to do homology-directed repair. And more exper I would say this is all very experimental, but the, but the most experimental um, approaches are nanoparticles. So there are various companies and academic labs that are tr trying to design less toxic nanoparticles to introduce um, editing tools into cells, and also physical methods. So for example, there's a company called Squeeze, SQZ, that puts cells through a microcapillary to deform them, which changes the permeability of the cell membrane and allows proteins to enter the cells. And that actually looks promising, at least the data that we're seeing. Um, one point that I want to make is that, and you guys will appreciate this, um, in, this, in, this uh, in this returning the cells to the body, as, at least as it applies to HSCs, hematopoietic stem cells, you've got to give your patient conditioning before, um, if you want those stem cells to engraft, which adds another layer of potential harm to the patient. And um, as, as with gene therapy, I'm sure that there will be debate about how much conditioning to give them. The, you're most likely to succeed if you give them full myeloablative conditioning, and you're most likely to induce toxicity in the patient as well. Okay, let's, um, a, a few words about off-target effects. So, edit, nothing is perfect. Editing nucleases produce double-stranded breaks a, a, at unintended sites. And most of these double-stranded breaks are probably harmless if they're repaired by non-homologous end joining. However, some could be harmful. And, um, and so there, there's a, a whole area of research that's dedicated to, to, to detection of these off-target effects. And there are numerous assays to look for this. The first thing you can do is you can do bioinformatic searches. You can see it for CRISPR-Cas9 or, or you, well, for any of them, you can say what looks like my target sequence. And you can take your top matches and you can test them by PCR and, and targeted sequencing. 
You can do whole genome sequencing, but that's really going out of vogue because it's not very sensitive, because it would be very expensive to sequence to the depth that you would need to detect a rare event. So um, uh, uh, um, a, a number of labs have, have, have designed fancy genome-based, whole genome-based methods to detect double-stranded breaks at high sensitivity. And I'll show you an example of one in the next slide. But these, these, these can detect double-stranded breaks down to about 0.1%. Um, and these have various, uh, various different names. And they're all, they're all based, on, based on tagging the site of the break followed by sequencing. So you're only sequencing regions where the break occurred, which will increase the sensitivity of the, uh, of the deep sequencing. Um, so here's an example. This is an approach called, uh, call, ca called GuideSeq. Um, and um, this, th this was developed by Shendar Sai in Keith Jong's lab. And, you, and in this method, you tag the breaks with an oligonucleotide, and then you sequence across the, the, the oligonucleotide. And here's some examples of data output. And, and, and this is the number of breaks per genome with different guides. And the important point to see here is that it, it really can vary according to the guide in ways that are sometimes difficult to predict. There was not good correlation between the bioinformatic predictions and this data. So some guides are going to work well and some guides are going to have off-target effects. Um, now this is, this is the nightmare, right? This is the, the, what, what you can detect off-target effects to 0.1%, but it's what you can't see that could hurt you. And, um, and, and for, the case of, for the case of hematopoietic stem cells or any tissue, people are worried about cancer. The worry is that you're going to cause a break in some gene that is going to give the cells a proliferative advantage and you're going to end up with, with clonal pro proliferation. So, the, for example, if you were to target P53 inadvertently, you know, that, that would be easy to detect. You could figure that out. But there's probably a million other places in the, well, there's probably many other places in the genome where you could target that could do this. Um, so it's low likelihood but high significance. And the problem is good methods to detect this are lacking. This is a real problem in the field. People are worried about it and people are working on it, but it's a hard thing to detect. And, and, and I'll just give you, a, a, you know, as, a, as a parallel example, is the, um, uh, we know about the development of, um, of leukemia after gamma retroviral gene therapy for immunodeficiencies that occurred maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And it, it was calculated that these leukemias arose from events that were one in 30,000 uh, cells um, where the virus integrated in, in, in a bad spot, which couldn't be detected by any of these methods. So this is a, this is a problem that needs to be tackled. So, so, so based on this, one would like to improve the specificity of the nucleases. If you have a good site and you have a nuclease that produces many double-stranded breaks, then you want to make it better. And there are a number of ways to do that, a number of approaches, and, and this is also very, very active in the field, and um, some of the methods are shown here. The first thing is you don't, when you put these editing tools in cells, you want it to be transient. You want to do a hit and run. You want them to do their thing and go away, because the longer they're there, the more likely they are to produce side effects or off-target effects. And so, um, and so um, investigators will deliver messenger RNA or ribonucleoprotein, as I told you, the protein bound to the guide RNA, or they'll use non-integrating viral vectors so that the cells will divide and the vector will be diluted out to nothing as the cells divide. And that's a way to edit just for a short amount of time to reduce off-target effects. Um, also, um, you could, one could consider the platform. So the, the, the ta mega tails and the zinc fingers and talons are thought to be more specific um, um, because you, you require two copies. Uh, th there's, more, there's more sequence complementarity required. Um, but there are also many different um, Cas9-like molecules that are being discovered now, dozens of them from different organisms, and they have varying specificity. So there's a new programmable nuclease called CPF1 that that people think is promising because it, 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 uh, the way it binds DNA uh, make, makes it um, have less, um, uh, uh, less off-target effects. Um, the, um, you can also, uh, um, um, structural biologists have also modified the guide RNAs or the nucleases by, by protein engineering to make 
m more, speci more specific cutting enzymes in a, in a rational structural based manner by changing the affinity between the, D the RNA guide and the DNA in the protein. Um, and, um, and then there are also approaches to, to where you would avoid double-stranded breaks. So for example, instead of, um, instead of making a double-stranded break, you'll engineer your nucleases to make two nicks on either side, which is less likely to form a double-stranded break, and, you, and two of them have to come together um, compared to something that would just cut the DNA. But I think from my take on this is all of these are very useful but it's not all consolidated or understood yet. And, and if you have a specific problem, the approach is pretty empiric. You find something that works and you, and you, and you, you do the best you can to characterize the off-target effects. And if they look pretty minimal, that's what you would go with. And I think that's how things are working now. Um, okay, so these are my conclusions. Um, uh, here are the basic principles of, of gene editing. Um, the main tools are program, programmable nucleases that create double-stranded breaks. These are zinc fingers, CRISPR-Cas, megatals, and talons. Um, a double-stranded break has two potential outcomes. Homology-directed repair, which is precise, so that you could fix a point mutation, for example, and non-homologous end joining, which is impre imprecise and good at disrupting things. Um, HDR for precise gene manipulation is more difficult. Therapeutic delivery can be in vivo or ex vivo, and each has certain complexities and, and problems and benefits. Um, Off-target double-stranded breaks can be measured up to about one in a thousand, but understanding the, the biological consequences of those breaks and breaks that occur at rarer frequencies that you can't see is, is a problem now. Um, there are numerous ways to make the specificity greater for DNA editing, and this, is, this field is advancing, and, and the, the entire field is advancing very quickly. So what I tell you today is probably going to be different than what we would tell you next year. Okay, so I want to thank you, and, 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 and I want to um, first thank Dan and Val for inviting me to give this talk, and I want to thank my lab members, and I, I want to thank Chuck Sher and Liang Lee at St. Jude, who really helped members of my lab get started with, 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 with um, our editing experiments, and um, my funding is here, and thank you. Thanks, Mitch, for providing that really terrific overview and setting the stage for our next speaker. Um, so Stu Orkin is the David G. Nathan Professor of Pediatrics um, at Harvard Medical School in Boston Children's Hospital. Um, Stu has had incredible number of honors, which would take the rest of the session to list, so I won't do that. But um, he has published almost 300 papers um, on many, many different aspects of hematology, uh, including hemoglobinopathies, more recently stem cell biology, and then more recently uh, therapeutic genome editing. So he is going to expand a little bit on some of the clinical applications in hematology and oncology that uh, Mitch has mentioned. I think we need some AV help. So in the next few minutes, if we have the slides, I'm going to uh, uh, cover uh, uh, some of the same territory that Mitch did, uh, but present some additional data about uh, where this field is today. So this covers uh, uh, briefly uh, some territory that Mitch covered. Uh, we have a number of ways to edit genes. Uh, the uh, we talk now about zinc fingers, talons, and CRISPRs, but there's a historically conventional gene targeting, uh, so-called homologous recombination, which has been actively used to make uh, knockout mice, for example. And if we compare these, uh, this is, has low efficiency. The other methods have high efficiency. Uh, this is relatively uh, uh, difficult to use in the sense that you need to make specific constructs, and it's not applicable for uh, any sort of therapeutic purpose, uh, but it's very accurate. Uh, there's no clinical application of this. Zinc fingers actually are in the clinic. They've been used to disrupt the HIV receptor in some studies from uh, Sangamo Biosciences, a, a company in California. Uh, and the current rage of CRISPR-Cas9 is because, it, as Mitch described, it's very easy to use. Any laboratory can do it. Uh, it's very high efficiency and will likely make it to the clinic. 
Before getting into sort of more practical aspects about uh, application of the technology, I think it's worth just stepping back and asking why would one want to edit genes in the first place? Well, one obvious reason is to test the function of a gene or protein in cells or in animals. Another is a very powerful technology in practice now for gene discovery. Uh, one can use large scale screening methods now with these tools. One can map the functional domains of proteins using these tools, dissect regulatory elements in situ, meaning within the chromosome, and gene therapy or gene editing, which is the topic today. Uh, now, for one of the disorders which I'll touch on, sickle cell disease, which we've known about for more than 60, more than 100 years, but we've known the specific mutation for more than 60 years due to Vernon Ingram, uh, who worked after Linus Pauling on this problem. But I think it's really important to uh, restate that knowing the molecular basis for more than 50 years has not helped us in terms of our current therapies. There's no therapy that depends on knowing the molecular basis. And as Mitch described, this is what we'd like to do, the simplest case, that is replace the one nucleotide or repair it. But uh, as he mentioned, it's hard, and I'll come back to that a little later. Having said that, we've come a very long way. And this is really sort of the beginning of the field for mammalian biologists. This is the work of Oliver Smithies, who unfortunately passed away just a few months ago. But here's Oliver getting his Nobel Prize, basically for this paper in which he described homologous recombination into the human beta globin locus in cells. And the important point here is the planned modification occurred in about one in every thousand or so transformed cells. That was cells that took up the DNA. So this was an exceedingly inefficient uh, process, but it was very specific. We've actually come a long way. Uh, here we were in 1985 with Oliver Smithies, and in 2015, 2017, depending sort of which paper you want to point to, we're now in the range of 20 to 50 percent editing efficiency. So we've gone uh, many orders of magnitude in terms of efficiency, and I, I think with current developments, uh, the likelihood is we'll do even better going forward. Now, this is sort of the bottom line for those who want a take-home message. I'll come back to this later. But what's the clinical impact of this field? Well, the near-term opportunity is ex vivo editing for the most part, at least in hematology. As Mitch mentioned, for eye disease, one can do direct injection. But for hematology, it's really going to be ex vivo therapy for the most part, with one exception I'll come to. And it's largely... Uh, gene disruption with perhaps another exception or two. If one wants to do gene correction, we're talking about an opportunity that's a few years off. We don't know how far, but several years down the road. And if we're really talking about um, more extensive kind of manipulations in vivo, organ system, engineered delivery, we're talking many years down the road. Now, the various genomic uh, impacts of the various approaches uh, are sort of uh, diagrammed out here with um, gamma retroviruses, which M Mitch mentioned in the first gene therapy experiments that led, unfortunately, to some cases of leukemia. Uh, they have the greatest impact because they insert in many places in the genome. Uh, lentiviruses, which insert in many places, are thought to be less uh, injurious, if you will, uh, zinc fingers, talons, and crispers, depending sort of exactly what flavor you look at, are less damaging in terms of off-target effects in the genome. Uh, however, this is still a field that's undergoing um, considerable improvements, as Mitch described. And I think in terms of the applications, one obviously has to balance what's practical versus the theoretical risk uh, in any of these approaches. This is sort of another bottom line um, sort of overall message, and that is what does one really have to think about if one's going to introduce um, editing into the clinic? Uh, 
one needs the proper target sequences to edit where there's preclinical evidence that targeting that sequence will actually be of clinical benefit. In other words, you want to be certain you're going to do the right thing in, in the cells. What's this proper choice of cells? How do you want to acquire those cells? And that's going to vary for different disease settings, whether it's stem cells, T cells, liver, other cells. What's the best platform for editing? Is it zinc fingers? Is it CRISPR? New systems coming along. Uh, the rage is CRISPRs, but zinc fingers work quite well. Uh, it's just they're a much more difficult to engineer. Do you want homologous recombination or homology directed repair or non homologous end joining? Um, can, can one get high enough efficiency in the, in the desired alleles? How do we know if we're doing a good job? What's an acceptable off target um, of editing, if any? Uh, off target is acceptable. We have to do all this at clinical GMP scale, which is often forgotten. Most of the experiments you read about are done in mice in laboratories. They're not done in the kind of scale that's required. We need the availability of suitable patients uh, for trials. And I think the last point I wouldn't, uh, I really think needs triple emphasis, and that is a skilled clinical team. These are difficult clinical experiments to um, develop, and I think it requires expert clinical care at all points. Okay, so what are some of the, the um, uh, clinical applications on the horizon? Some of this Mitch touched on. One can think about in vivo gene editing, perhaps injecting AAV into a portal vein to access the liver, or ex vivo therapy, either for T cells, hematopoietic stem cells. One could get more fanciful and talk about iPS cells, human pluripotent, pluripotent cells in the future. I'm only going to address three of these right uh, today. Uh, liver therapy, which is one form of in vivo gene therapy, and this is for hemophilia. Uh, T cells, which are useful for CAR T cell therapy. Uh, and hematopoietic stem cells. So these are the three areas. In terms of liver gene editing uh, in vivo, there are two approaches that have been explored already preclinically. One is gene repair using homology directed repair, where one introduces a nuclease with one of these donor template sequences to, to uh, correct the gene. Or an alternative way is to really use a, a safe locus, if you will, and place an expressible gene within the albumin locus, uh, which is a highly expressed gene, obviously, in the liver, and to do that by homology-directed repair into an individual site. Example of the first kind of approach was actually published a number of years ago in a model for hemophilia from the laboratory of Kathy High, in which you, uh, one used um, uh, a nuclease to essentially make a cut within uh, the factor IX gene and then to use a donor sequence to correct the factor IX mutation nearby. And when one makes a double-stranded break in the DNA, it allows this kind of repair to occur. And this can be done in mice. And a second example is shown here more recently from manuscript in blood in which, one, uh, which the investigators used the albumin locus as a place to put in the factor IX gene to insert it within the albumin gene to use the potency of the albumin gene to express the, the transgene. And, and these kinds of approaches are moving forward in preclinical studies and uh, I think will uh, probably uh, go to uh, the patient in the next several years. What about T cells? I won't say much about CAR T cells, except obviously if, if one, uh, if the object is to make improved CAR T cells, there are various ways to do this. And one way that's recently been described in this uh, paper in Nature is actually to uh, put in the chimeric receptor right into the T cell receptor by uh, homologous um, directed repair. Uh, in, in T cells and then to use those. And this is, uh, I think, going to be used as well and maybe one of the first applications of the CRISPR system in, in patients. 
Then I'll touch on ex vivo hematopoietic uh, stem cell therapy, particularly in the context of the hemoglobin disorders. And this is the uh, general scheme, and that is to take a, an individual, be an adult, not a child, for initial kinds of uh, clinical trials, where we'll isolate stem cells, essentially CD34 cells. One will do something to these cells to edit or modify genes. One will modify a fraction of the genes in the population. Not all the cells will be edited. And one will reintroduce these back into a conditioned patient and hopefully reveal clinical benefit. Now, in terms of the hemoglobin disorders, there are a number of, asp a number of different approaches that are being considered. Uh, one is repairing the sickle cell uh, allele itself by homology-directed repair. Mitch has touched on that. Uh, there are many other strategies, but there are really only two, I think, that are currently under active investigation. One is to recreate uh, hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin alleles, such as Mitch described, and this is using non-homologous end joining, so one doesn't have to make a perfect uh, repair. Uh, and among other targets, there's the enhancer for the B cell of an A repressor of fetal hemoglobin, which I'll touch on in just a moment. These are really the only three approaches, I think, that are under active study now using uh, various forms of editing. In terms of gene therapy, though, for the hemoglobinopathies or sickle, there are a number of different options as summarized here in a blood review. The method that's been reported uh, for example, from a bluebird uh, by gene therapy with a, a, um, a retrovirus or, or lentivirus is to, re is to basically add another globin gene to the cells, usually a non-sickling beta gene uh, or something of that variety. Uh, one can also think about gene correction, which is the most difficult. But the, there are additional strategies to induce fetal hemoglobin, as Mitch described, one is to recreate uh, the hereditary persistence alleles. Another is to uh, inactivate the B-cell enhancer, which I'll describe. Another is to generate a loop within the beta globin complex. And all of these are under study. So it just gives you an idea that there are, very, there are various approaches to the same uh, general outcome. And really, the goal is this simple. Uh, it's really to allow the regulatory element of the globin cluster called the LCR to activate the gamma gene as it does in fetal life uh, and uh, really reverse the adult gene expression and turn it back to here. That's the essential goal of all the efforts. We focus considerably on B cell 11A as a repressor of fetal hemoglobin. And if I can sum up uh, several years of work with one slide, it's basically this. It's really a, a rheostat or somebody going to your home thermostat. If you dial it down, you dial up fetal hemoglobin. If you dial it the other way, you repress fetal hemoglobin. It's really, it's a quantitative progressive regulator. And over the last uh, number of years, we've gone from an original identification of the gene through genome-wide association studies, through a variety of studies, to eventually target sequences within the gene that are being pursued now in a preclinical manner for therapy. In addition to that approach, uh, there's one that I think deserves mention in this context, and that is a sort of second generation gene therapy uh, which, uh, for which the, we hope there will be a trial uh, that David Williams at Children's Hospital in Boston is establishing in which the B cell 11A expression is knocked down using shRNA. So this is not an editing, it's really a, just a form of gene therapy, but the knockdown is in a erythroid specific manner and using this kind of, of vector. But the, uh, the results in the immunodeficient mice, the same system that Mitch described, are really quite impressive because here one can reach really quite um, 
uh, profound levels of hemoglobin F in long-term uh, transplanted mice. And this uh, um, is going forward and, and may be a clinical trial within the next uh, number of months. B11A is interesting because as a single target, if disrupted, it's sufficient to rescue sickle cell disease. And this is a sickle cell uh, engineered mouse that has these kinds of cells. If you remove B cell of an A in only the erythroid cells, you correct the hematology, you express lots of fetal hemoglobin in this system, and uh, the mice are perfectly well. This gene, though, is expressed in a number of places, but an important aspect is that within this large gene, there's an intron, a very large intron, which has erythroid hypersensitive sites, uh, which are not present in brain or B cells, which also express the gene, uh, and blown up in this uh, region of about 10 kilobases is an erythroid enhancer. And uh, so this gene is expressed in a number of other sites. It's expressed in B cells, developing red cells, somatopoietic stem cells, mammary tissue in the brain. But if one generates mice which lack that 10 kb segment, which is the erythroid enhancer, these mice are perfectly normal. They're viable mice. They have no problem with any other uh, organ functions that we can determine. And if you mate them with the appropriate kind of uh, mice which have the human beta -glo globin cluster, instead of having the beta gene expressed, in uh, their fetal liver, which is the equivalent of, of sort of the fetal stage, the beta gene is off, and the gamma gene, which is off in the mouse, is now fully on. So one can sort of recapitulate the knockout phenotype uh, just by removing the enhancer. And so one of the challenges over the last couple of years has been to see how one could do this in a safe manner uh, and to search for an Achilles heel, if you will, within this 10 kilobase enhancer. And this is the work of Dan Bauer, Sophia Kamran, originally in my lab, and now Dan has his own laboratory at Children's Hospital. But the long and short is one can reduce that 10 kilobase enhancer to a small region of perhaps uh, a couple of dozen base pairs, which if disrupted with non-homologous end joining, essentially impair expression of the gene but only in erythroid cells, nowhere else in the body. Mitch has described sort of an alternative approach, which is to recreate hereditary persistence, in this case by mutating the gamma promoter itself. Now these approaches may seem entirely sort of disconnected, except for one interesting development in the field. This is a paper from more than 30 years ago by Francis Collins and Bernie Fourget. And here, George Stamatianopoulos, two papers that appeared in Nature, which described the Greek form of hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin. This is a form in which there's a single nucleotide uh, base change at minus 115, uh, I believe it's minus 115 or 117, never remember. Uh, it's a G to an A change in these patients. Uh, so this is not a deletion, this is a single base change. But what we've been able to determine over the last uh, number of months is in fact that the preferred recognition site for the protein B cell of an A is precisely the sequence found twice within that region. So in fact, what was studied 30 years ago was a point mutation in the binding site for the B cell of an A repressor. And the 13 base pair deletion essentially takes out the cis element that that repressor binds. So in, in a way, we're now sort of closing the circle in terms of the pathophysiology. So where are we clinically at this time? Uh, if one thinks ahead, well, there are various options for hemoglobin F induction kind of therapy. Uh, there's genome engineering of the B cell of enhancer, there's recreation of HPFH, and there's erythroid-specific down-regulation of B cell of A, the trial I mentioned, uh, hopefully that will go on later this year. Uh, and so these are at least three different approaches to the same outcome, and I think they'll, uh, hopefully they'll all be explored to see which ones uh, are really the preferred ones and which 
which approach uh, has the best effect and the least um, uh, off-target effects, if you will. Now, what about correcting the sickle cell mutation? Mitch already described this, and uh, there are a number of examples in the literature. Quite recently, um, two papers in which investigators have uh, demonstrated specific correction of the sickle cell mutation, but the important point is right down here. As Mitch mentioned, the indels, or the non-homologous end joining, greatly exceed the correction. So the indels are red, uh, the correction is in blue. So the correction is at the expense of also inactivating a copy of the beta globin gene. And the question I think the put before those who have to make the decision about when this moves forward clinically is how much sort of off target that is non-repair can you tolerate if this is gonna go forward as a therapy. So in terms of sort of the clinical time scale, where are we? Well, I think we're at the point now where we can really anticipate very near term uh, CAR T cell modification as one uh, application of editing and also hemoglobin F induction uh, by a variety of different approaches uh, and possibly in vivo uh, editing in the case of uh, uh, hemophilias, although I'm not sure where that is poised clinically at this moment. And I think other opportunities exist uh, further down the line. Uh, for the work that uh, was done in my own group in B11A, I just want to really acknowledge those uh, really talented people who have been involved, Vijay Sankaran and Guillaume Letra. Guillaume is a geneticist who's in Montreal, actually. Uh, Jan Zhu, who's now in uh, Dallas, Texas at UT Southwestern. Dan Bauer, Matt Canver, Sophia Cameron, and uh, Cruz Smith. Uh, thank you. All right, well, thank you, Stu, for um, expanding on some of the issues that Mitch, that Mitch touched on and raising the potential, but yet some of the other issues that may come up with as we try to translate these gene editing uh, processes to patients themselves. Um, both Mitch and Stu touched on some of these uh, concerns, and, and then I'd like to invite uh, Chris Scott up to talk about some of the ethical and regulatory issues that surround uh, genome editing. Chris is the Dalton Tomlin Chair in Medical Ethics and Health Policy um, at, uh, at Baylor, and also the Associate Director of the Health Policy at the Center for Medical Ethics and Health Policy at Baylor in Houston. Chris. I'd like to thank uh, Dan and Val for the nice invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and also uh, an honor to be here with uh, Mitch and Stu. Um, I wanted to talk today a little bit about the ethical and policy implications of genome editing technologies and the best way, I think, to describe this, at least from uh, a policy and ethics point of view, is through the lens of gene therapy. Gene therapy has been mentioned several times in this talk and is, a, is at the center of a new National Academies report out just a few weeks ago, which I will end up uh, on in the talk today. So today I'm going to describe uh, and repeat for you a little bit about the somatic gene therapies that are now close to the clinic or in the clinic and using those technologies as a guide also talk about uh, the fact that we may be able to edit the human germline. And as you know, if you've been following the press at all the last year or so, the possibilities of actually editing human germline, in effect, designing babies with these technologies, um, are capturing the imagination and sometimes the worries of um, a number of folks, including those of us that work in ethics. And along the way, I'll give you some ideas about what we in ethics and policy are thinking about both of these trajectories in uh, genome editing. 
So f first, a, a little bit of a review and perhaps a way to situate this in terms of the, the history of science. Um, one of the things that I like to do is when we're talking about ethics and policy, kind of rewind the clock and look at how we've addressed these uh, sorts of concerns in the past. This is from an article I published last year in Nature Biotech, a review with uh, Laura De Francesco. It's a review of those ex vivo therapies that are close are in the clinic. And we begin with how um, next generation viral vectors have essentially changed the field of gene therapy. And after a 10 year or 15 year hiatus of the trials in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, have become um, very predominant uh, players in the clinic. So in the beginning, uh, the first generation of viral vectors uh, had enhancer and promoter regions in the LTR uh, areas of the gene that when they integrated into the uh, genome transactivated the adjacent genes. Now these have been removed, an internal promoter has been inserted, and these uh, adjacent transactivations have been reduced. These are the so-called SIN inactivating viral vectors. Uh, they are now um, deep into clinical trials. And this is a diagram of the studies and the history uh, of primi primarily hematopoietic stem cell trials in the viral vectors uh, that have made it from the first generation um, gamma retroviral vectors that have been talked about in talks prior to the new self-inactivating vectors. So the milestone I'd like to point you uh, to here is a, around 2000. So these are the trials that were referenced uh, earlier in Mitch's talk, I believe, the French and UK trials for, for SCID. Uh, these were trials involving about 20 uh, children with SCID, five of those children um, encountered uh, uh, transformations of cells in um, leukemia. But the interesting thing about this particular part of history is that seven of those children were essentially cured. So depending on your point of view, this results either in the top of, of uh, advances in gene therapy at that time or the bottom. Um, many will say that this really led to the next generation of, of uh, self-inactivating vectors. So if you take this landscape now and map it out, we see that there are over two dozen trials now underway with the new generation uh, gene vectors. Um, there are hundreds of patients enrolled, and the hallmark of this is last year's EMA approval for a gamma retroviral vector. This is the first generation vector, interestingly, uh, Strimvelis, GlaxoSmithKline in collaboration with the Naldini lab. So these have already been described to you in perfect detail already. Um, I just want to make a couple of points here. From a policy point of view, we look at technologies both in terms of their applications and in terms of other issues like cost and accessibility. So I would describe CRISPR-Cas9 as a democratizing technology. So this definition commonly used in uh, our literature is something that is readily accessible to a large number of laboratories on just one issue, for example, cost, to engineer a protein through zinc finger uh, or tau approaches can approach $5,000 per molecule. CRISPR, on the other hand, can be engineered relatively easily, $30 or so, using off-the-shelf sort of advances. As described, it's very efficient. Um, it is um, in the hands of a number of laboratories and as a result is causing a lot of interest uh, in both the therapeutic and laboratory applications. So just to kind of punctuate the fact that we have CRISPR, Cas9, and other gene editing technologies in or close to a clinic. Um, Stu mentioned the zinc finger uh, knockout for CCR5 in, HR, in HIV. This is a small company in the San Francisco Bay Area, Sangamo 
biosciences. They've been at this for almost 12 years. I reported the first um, of their patents back in 2005, and they have, um, in min many ways, cornered the market on zinc finger uh, approaches using the technology. This particular trial is with um, uh, 12, I believe, patients. All of them have shown improved um, resistance to HIV, and six have been taken off of antiretroviral therapy. In 2006, a Talon safety trial was approved in the UK. This is a basis on one case study with a girl who had leukemia. The idea behind this Talon trial is uh, basically a, um, a stay therapy until a better donor match can be found. Um, this has uh, started in 2017 with enrolling patients. In 2016, last year, two notable approvals um, for uh, CRISPR. One was an FDA-approved trial for a T-cell knock-in and also a knockout um, arm to the study at UPenn. And then the Chinese reported in 2016, I believe just a little bit after this report, that they were using CRISPR for a knockout in PD-1 and lung cancer. Uh, 20 patients were enrolled in that study. So these are, I remind you, ex vivo approaches, but just uh, to say that they are uh, in the clinic or close to the clinic. So with all of this in mind as a background, what does this mean for ethics and policy? Well, I think for many of the deliberations for ethics, this uh, becomes the shadow of Jesse Gelsinger. So Jesse Gelsinger, as you know, was the infamous uh, in vivo study back in 1999. That, along with the SCID trials, uh, basically led to a halt of all FDA trials in the U.S. in 2004. And as a result, the field basically went into hibernation. So I think as regulatory agencies uh, and others look at the safety and risk associations with CRISPR-Cas9, they will be thinking and perhaps referring to the Gelsinger case, uh, either for good or bad. I think you can argue both ways here. Um, the hallmarks of the Gelsinger study was that there were conflicts of interest between the investigator and the company that was supplying the therapy that this investigator perhaps was over-enthusiastic in the recruitment of patients, including young Gelsinger, and also that the risk assessment of the trial before it was given the green light was perhaps incomplete. In other words, not great enough attention to mouse and in vivo studies. These are things that no doubt will play into the first trials using CRISPR-Cas9 and other technologies. Some of the things that we look at in ethics uh, are who will be able to use these therapies first. This is commonly called distributive justice. These questions will come up undoubtedly with the first therapies for genome editing. There are an interesting set of debates going on between the original discoverers of um, some of the retroviral therapies, especially the two PIs that were part of the SCID trial in France. Those individuals now are debating each other about whether new um, approaches could be actually used in developing countries first. If they were scaled properly and made efficient, these could be game changers for those countries with high economic burdens of anemias uh, and sickle cell. On the other hand, if you're taking the approach that uh, the cost of these would be very high, then these could be exorbitant and out of the reach of um, even uh, those particular uh, countries that have uh, robust healthcare systems. So one particular solution is being debated in the EU and UK about progressive payments. Let's say we have a, uh, a new gene therapy that is able to um, have some sort of a profound therapeutic effect. In this case, payments would be reduced over the years based on how that proof plays out in a person's life. Even with that kind of a calculation, these costs would be exorbitant. The last estimate I read was close to 1 million euros per treatment. The other question here is whether a cost 
for one treatment, if it's scaled down and affordable, can be uh, transferred to other diseases, open question. And then finally, uh, as we've talked about today, on and off, the risk and benefits. These may be permanent cures. Um, you may be able to, in single gene or even multi-gene uh, instances, be able to cure the disease. If that's the case, um, that would, of course, be an enormous benefit for healthcare. However, those sorts of changes um, may be introduced into the genome that would be irreversible, uh, persisting as long as the individual does. And if we um, consider those germline sort of approaches, it would persist not only for that generation, for, but for generations beyond. Right now, if we're looking at safety and efficacy for these sorts of therapies, we have very few patients, um, a handful, dozens perhaps, that we're looking at that have um, had the therapies over a fairly short amount of time. Most of them are young. Um, we need to have um, uh, systems and assays in place uh, to show that there is um, low evidence of transformation, tumor genesis, uh, and of course the off-target analysis. So all of these will get factored in to risk and benefit uh, solutions um, and recommendations from federal and probably local agencies too. So let's switch gear a little bit to germline editing. So this has taken really the world by storm in terms of its possibilities and its controversies. I'll start really with the first article that was published back in 2014 by a group of Chinese scientists who generated um, monkeys using CRISPR-Cas9. Those are the pictures of the little guys. I find that it's really interesting when you look at CRISPR-engineered animals, they always pick the cutest pictures um, for, the, for the journals. When that came out, there were a group of us at Stanford, uh, frankly, quite frankly, heard drums beating. Because once you've actually entered the primate sort of model, you can be sure that human experiments uh, aren't far behind. And sure enough, a year later, in a very small journal called Protein and Cell, a group in China reported that they had introduced a CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. Um, I believe it was a knockout, I'm not quite sure, um, uh, in human non-viable embryos. And I'll say again, human non-viable embryos. So these embryos were not um, uh, viable. They could not be transplanted and could not therefore make a baby. That study was followed yet by another group, also Chinese, that uh, introduced the modifications. Now, it's either the knock-in or knock-out, both of these experiments, one did one, one did the other, um, also in um, triple nucle nuclear uh, embryos, non-viable embryos. So those experiments as a collection, especially the second, caused a stir, and that stir uh, reached the deepest levels of policymaking and ethics in the US and abroad. And two articles appeared. One was in the journal Nature in 2016. This was written by the scientists at Sangamo uh, Sciences along with others. Their recommendation in this uh, particular commentary was that we should stop CRISPR-Cas9 uh, germline research. Uh, they effectively called for a moratorium and then went on to say that we needed to uh, assay our uh, science and efficacy before we move forward. Within a week, another article appeared in Science. It turns out that these two groups were working independently, uh, trying to get to the press uh, before each other, as usual. This group was uh, chaired by David Baltimore and Paul Berg, my former boss at Stanford. These individuals, if you have um, a sense of history, were behind the Asilomar conference in the 1970s about recombinant DNA. This was, of course, a recapitulation of that event up in Marin County. They had a number of uh, prominent bioethicists and scientists on the paper, and they suggested in this particular report that uh, making babies was unethical at this stage of our knowledge. Uh, so therapeutic uh, applications um, and reproductive uses um, verboten for now. But they left open the question about whether 
these sorts of experiments could continue in the laboratory, so-called in vitro applications. So again, what sort of issues does this raise for ethics and policy? Well, we've talked today about some of the um, possible downsides of the risk in uh, genome editing technologies, the off-target effects, mosaicism, where some cells are edited, some are not. Uh, incomplete editing efficiencies, of course, uh, need to be improved. And then, of course, in vivo approaches, the fact that we might have an, an uh, active DNA vector. I'll summarize the concerns and uh, interest in two statements. One is from the authors, um, actually I think, believe this is, yeah, this is from the authors of the Chinese paper, the, the second, the first one. Um, taken together, our data underscore the need to more comprehensively understand the mechanisms of CRISPR-Cas9 mediated genome editing in human cells and support the notion that clinical applications of CRISPR-Cas9 may be premature at this stage. Former colleague of mine uh, at Stanford, Matt Porcius, told me in 2016, we know that cancer derives from just one cell. We have no way to adequately assess that preclinically. My bias is that we, until we understand this, we should probably not be making breaks in genes that have a known cancer risk to them. So the Chinese team came under criticism for a so-called therapeutic use, in other words, doing an experiment that might lead to therapies that was premature. However, I note that uh, in this particular experiment, they are going after exactly uh, the risks and benefits concerns that were raised in both the science and the Nature papers. So what sort of questions might we consider for this as an audience, as a nation, um, as society? Well, one of them uh, comes from the science paper. Would it be appropriate to use the technology to change the disease causing genetic mutation in the sequence uh, more typical among healthy people? If we have a chance to edit congenital blindness out of an embryo, should we? Changing my daughter's disability would have made us and her different in a way that we would have regretted. Ethan Weiss is at UCSF, he's a cell biologist. Anyone who has to actually face the reality of one of these diseases is not going to have a remote compunction about thinking there is any moral issue at all. John Sabine is the brother of, um, I think his name is Matt Sabine, one of the UK's foremost legal minds who is suffering from Alzheimer's disease. At our peril, we are right now trying to decide what ways of being in the world ought to be eliminated. Uh, Rosemary is, uh, is a disability scholar based in Emory. So with those sorts of things in mind, and whether or not we should proceed in the laboratory, I will tell you that two such approvals have been granted, one of them in the UK. So the UK just recently got a green light to genetify, uh, genetically modify, rather, uh, human embryos. Now these are viable embryos, not non-viable embryos. And of course, this was subject to fairly rigorous um, ethics review. These embryos will be grown to seven days and then destroyed. The Swiss, uh, in parallel, uh, have been seeking approval to edit the DNA of human uh, embryos for a similar sort of um, work. This is a little bit old. I don't know if that approval has gone forward. So wrapping up all of this into the 2017 National Academies report that came out just a few weeks ago, they have been taking all of this information, the scientific uh, information that we know from uh, publications um, and the laboratory, the ethical considerations both here in the U.S. and abroad, uh, and they have, uh, this is probably the best title of the year, U.S. panel gives yellow light to human embryo editing. I'll give you what I think are the take home points from this report. Uh, the first one is the biggest one, and that's that it moves away from heritable changes to uh, non-heritable changes in the genome to heritable changes. So it is basically giving a cautious uh, green light 
to endorse heritable uses of gene editing and those alterations designed to prevent babies from acquiring genes to known, a very important language here, to cause serious disease and disability when there is no reasonable alternative. Now, these words will be parsed um, uh, probably uh, into infinity as we uh, get towards uh, actually approving the first uh, therapies for serious uh, diseases. They also recommended public discussions must precede decisions about whether or how to pursue clinical trials. This in my area uh, of research is called public engagement. They have not only recommended this once, but they've recommended it twice in separate recommendations. So this will emerge as something that uh, we can see going forward. It would prohibit alterations resembling enhancement, including off-label applications. I'll give you an example. So um, CRISPR-Cas9 might be used to edit the cells of a young individual with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, but that particular uh, intervention would be off limits for, let's say, an athlete that wanted to uh, strengthen his or her muscles for competition. Then finally, um, the report, and this is my own uh, kind of read of it, seeks to reassure um, the U.S. and other uh, countries that the regulatory uh, frameworks that we have in place at the federal level are going to be sufficient to look after this research. So to conclude, the open questions we have here are fairly interesting. Uh, first is, what is the line between treatment and enhancement? This line over the years, of course, has been fluid and will continue to be fluid as we uh, get closer to putting these um, therapies into the germline. We will have to understand and better define what we mean by rare. Other words in the report, what does better mean? Uh, what does enhancement mean? Uh, for me, I study uh, health span, lifespan, and aging research, so this has profound uh, consequences for our uh, aging selves at the end of life. Would we, for example, um, say that we should go ahead with a therapy that would give us less cognitive decline after 70? Interesting question. Who will have access? Who will pay? We've talked about that. Also, the, the changing nature of the human. So if we proceed with these therapies and others that would radically change what we know about ourselves, our personal identity without them, what does that mean for us uh, as a human? Um, this may, I think, um, lead to uh, new definitions of post-humanism or perhaps transhumanism, individuals that are um, enhanced in some way by the technologies such as CRISPR and others. Then finally, uh, one place that I spend a lot of my scholarly time are on the notions of hope. So how do these technologies play out now in terms of the fairly long and perhaps um, never timelines uh, for their applications? Um, I'll give you an example from my uh, own work uh, at Stanford over a decade. We studied the implications of regenerative medicine and stem cells, including how they were described and how they were perceived by those that might use them, including vulnerable populations and others with deadly diseases. This has led uh, in the near term to um, a significant problem in the U.S. called stem cell tourism. It's not just between countries, it's actually in the United States and running full force. This is an article published late last year by Paul Knopfler and Lee Turner, where it shows the number of unregulated stem cell clinics. In other words, those clinics offering interventions for which there is little or no scientific uh, evidence. These clinics offer these therapies for thousands of dollars to individuals who believe who have hope and who are willing to pay. So I raise this um, uh, not as to be a Cassandra about CRISPR. I'm a cell biologist. I strongly believe in technologies and the impact they have for our lives. But I also um, 
can see the other side from the ethics and policy point of view. We have to be careful about our approach to this in terms of where we move forward for our first therapies, who we offer them to, how they're regulated, and how we watch them over time. So I wanted to thank you for your attention today. This is the group at uh, Baylor College of Medicine. Just a, a clarification, we are Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, not Waco. So we are the Baylor that behaves. Um, and thank you very much.